Hi there, blessings in the name of the good Lord. Uh, here I have uh, a brochure with excerpts from the new revelation of Jesus Christ, the Lord's Word through Jacob Lorber and Gottfried Meyerhofer, given in the 19th century through direct dictation of so-called inner word. So this is the plan of creation and salvation revealed and the truth about Satan is we can find it unveiled in the new revelation but uh, yeah let's uh, remind friends that here is our reference website the new revelation.weebly.com and uh, from here you can find a lot of uh, excerpts and references about the new revelation and including the new revelation in other languages links to and here, for example, some links towards the books of the New Revelation translated in English and some of the uh, booklets I've made with uh, excerpts that I call brochures or studies. So the first, uh, uh, the books can be found here as you, this is the link. Um, there, all of them are translated now nothing is uh, missing so they can be downloaded as pdf uh, files and same the other we works with thematic excerpts uh yeah so let's go straight to the document which will be added to the other ones that i just showed you and we'll see what can be found in several of the books of the new revelation and this is the Lord speaking in the first person or uh, as given by him, you know, other people that were around him in different periods of history. For example, we will have excerpts from uh, the household of God, which is referring to the history of the first people from their creation, from Adam and Eve to the flood. And uh, the other one the time of the lord's mission on earth is mainly the big book great gospel of john in 25 books translated or initially 11 volumes uh, in total about 7000 pages containing everything we can find in the scriptures of course with countless other things added to it and practically there's no major question about the scriptures about the creation about the spiritual or natural fundamental issues that is not unveiled in this extraordinary work that no Christian church has ever be concerned with, not to mention to endorse it. And uh, at the time of the writing of the New Revelation, meaning there's a number of uh, writings that are given to either uh, Jacob Lorber or Gottfried Meyerhofer, which are addressing directly humanity at that time, or are presenting uh, facts about uh, the natural universe, the spiritual universe, or the afterlife of uh, people that died in the 19th century. So particularly we'll deal with this last category. There's two books, uh, Sunsets to Sunrises, or Bishop Martin, and the other one is Robert Bloom. Uh, yeah, the, some of the characters can be definitely identified in history. But let's go to the introduction in this subject. And for this, I have taken a short expert, ex, excerpt from Robert Blum, Volume 2, Chapter 153. This is the Lord speaking. If you have ears, then hear. Satan originally was created as a human spirit, but when he should have, through a commandment, recognized and accepted his freedom, he became indignant, and through scorning the commandment and therewith God himself, he fell from grace. But since, like Adam, he was to become a progenitor of future men for eternity, he also carried like a grain of seed within him immense multitude of future humans so to say wrenching them away from me his creator the result was the material creation of all the world which in itself is an essential judgment he himself can indeed for a long time still remain what he is 
me in Satan, but those countless human germs shall be taken from him along the hard way of matter, of course. These germs go forth out of his aggregate nature, partly from his hair, partly from his head, his neck, his tongue, his teeth, his breast, his inward parts, skin, hands, and feet. And behold, mankind, in order to reach the true stage of perfection, has to be treated and led according to which of fallen Satan's part it had originally proceeded from. Once this is known, can anyone rightfully confront me and say, Lord, why do you not help the miserable ones, letting them languish and perish? Behold, I permit none to perish, not even Satan and the virtual devils. But I cannot leave them the way they desire it in their blindness, opposed to my order upon which depends the maintaining of all things. Quite the contrary, I have to take care in every appropriate way that they may eventually attain to their goal, set them by my order from eternity. Right, so there is a brochure on this subject too, about universal salvation, that you can find here. So this is a most important, uh, here it is, that you can download immediately. It has got some uh, excerpts from the Bible too, in which we see that uh, God promises so. Uh, and wants the salvation of all, and of course he also has got the means for this, and this is absolutely confirmed in the New Revelation. Also, there are a few things that pertain to language and translation and the right understanding of concepts such as death, eternal death, and so on. There is also something about uh, spiritual language here. Let me show you. Symbolic images of the Bible explained in the New Revelation. So with these two brochures, I think quite a lot is given in order to understand the big picture, but no more than what we can find here. So let's hear further what the Lord is revealing, even through Satana's mouth. So Satana changes gender from woman to man. So you will see that sometimes this entity is called Satana, sometimes it's called Satan. Is the same first created being, Lucifer, but uh, yeah, we'll find more detail about her transformations, which are quite uh, astonishing. So this is from the Household of God, the first books given to Jacob Larber, uh, Volume 2, Chapter 157-158, so the Lord speaks through Jacob Larber. So the Holy Father surrounded by his children, Adam recognizes Abel, the last son, of course this is in his spiritual garment, in the second stranger, Satan, the old liar's abortive attempt to argue with the Lord, and it needs to be said that the Lord appears here, manifest through an angel, and is called Abba, right here Abba, we know means father. So let's read, thereupon Abba, the Lord manifest an angel said to Adam, So step closer to him, and it should become obvious whether you will recognize him or not. And Adam stepped closer to the stranger. When he was only several steps away from him, he suddenly gave a loud scream, for he recognized in the stranger his son Abel, and promptly made to dash at him. But Abel said to Adam, Stop and listen. Your children have embraced the right father. Why do you want to keep far from him, and in his stead embrace me, who am nothing compared to him? So turn around quickly, so as to reach him who alone is the eternal first cause of all beings. Otherwise, you will die this very day still. Behold, on the very day today, the great serpent was given free play. Of course, this is Satan. Today it is even allowed to crawl around on this height, so hurry up lest it catch up with you before you enter into the sphere of life. Look across towards your cave. Here he stands, the great enemy of life. So hurry, hurry, Father Adam, for he is quick like lightning and wrathful like a provoked lion. Here Adam ran quickly to Abba, who received him. But suddenly the prince of the world stood in human form between Abel and the group clinging to Abba, and screamed full of wrath. O oh, mighty one, why are you persecuting me here in my sphere? What have you to do with my creatures? Why do you want to snatch from me those who have not gone forth from you, but from me, 
thereby making me a childless father. Have you not countless legions of pure spirits sprung from you? Therefore, withdraw from the earth and from my entire great worldly realm, for this is my own, since it has gone forth from me and not from you. With your feet you trample on my property and are a thief in my realm, so withdraw from here. And Abba said to him, Blasphemer, how full of lies your mouth is. If this is your property, whose property then are you yourself? Who told you to come into being like other countless legions? What are you talking about a property? Show me a single plant on the ground of the earth which you created, and I will give you the entire earth and the entire visible heaven for your property. Miserable liar, now you are trembling before me because I have revealed your infamy. Why do you not tremble before yourself, since with each second you damn yourself deeper by an eternity through your great wickedness? Know that I am the Lord of heaven and earth, so withdraw, for this place is too holy for your feet. And the enemy disappeared from the height, howling and cursing. Chapter 158 Abba's warning against Satan's wickedness and cunning. Satan's weakness. Beware of yourselves. When the great enemy of life had disappeared, Abba said to the children clinging to him, Little children, did you hear what the arch liar dared talk in my presence? Therefore, beware of him, lest he talk you over and bring about your fall, for great is his wickedness, and his great slyness and cunning match his wickedness, so be three times as careful in front of him. He is a reprobate spirit who is not prepared to ever mend his ways or recognize me as the sole God of all holiness, might, and power, but is only intent on absolute power, always striving to weaken and finally completely destroy me, so that he may then assume all power over the heavens and all the world. Should he succeed in this, he would then, in his immense hate towards me, want to destroy everything that now exists. And once he had succeeded in this, to bring about a new creation, at his pleasure. However, in this new creation, there would exist nothing of eternal duration, but the existence of everything would only depend on his utterly free arbitrary action and exist only for as long as it afforded him some sensual pleasure. Once this had given him full satisfaction, an entire creation would promptly sink back into nothingness and another one again come into being for his sole pleasure. He would never create beings fully in his image, as for instance a man, but rather a woman, for his sensual gratification. However, she must be extremely sensitive so as to render her very receptive for all sorts of excesses to amuse him. In short, his ideas are so abominable that even a highest angel could not grasp them in their fullness. Therefore, do beware of him. You are now guessing in your heart, saying, why not destroy such a being which is so full of deadly wickedness? But then I ask each of you, which of you would go to the lowlands and kill Lamech, which is not a jot better than this enemy of life? Or if I brought to you once more the enemy of life, preparing him so that you could kill him in all earnest, would you do this even if he stood before you, however, full of wrath? Surely you would all mightily hesitate. Behold, if even you hesitated, and if possible with you, although your love is infinitesimal compared to mine, how much less will I be able to do this, I who am infinite eternal love myself, and am as well as his creator as yours, and am his God as well as yours, and his Lord as well as yours, and his still fatherly judge, just as I am your good father in person. However, as far as this was possible, the power of the will was taken from him. Therefore, you need no longer fear him in the least, but only beware of his slyness, which as such is powerless, so much so that you can fight it off more easily than you can a fly with a whiff of your breath if you want to. So he can continue to live and forever make futile attempts to destroy us, for in this he will succeed as little as a gnat in combat with a mama. But again, you are asking in your heart, wherein does the slyness of the enemy of life consist, which we should recognize and of which we should beware? For who can beware of something he does not know? 
little children, you are right in asking this in your heart, but all the same your question is really futile, for the enemy of life can and may not approach anyone, thus he cannot seduce anyone with his cunning. However, if a man lets himself be seduced by his own heart, becoming proud, arrogant, voluptuous, worldly and egotistical, then man himself spontaneously comes closer to the enemy of life, becomes one himself and is not seldom worse than the actual one in question, of whose cunning you must beware. When the real enemy of life notices such a kindred neighbor beside him, he no longer spares any effort to bind the one to him who, in his greatest semblance to him, had willingly approached him. Look, only then does the enemy's cunning to win over such a friend forever become effective. Therefore, whoever wants to escape the enemy's cunning shall be faithful and watchful shepherd of his own heart, turning the same carefully to me. If you heeded this always, truly, you can believe it, it would be easier for you to pull down the sun from the firmament than for the enemy of life to approach such a man with his cunning. So you shall not be fearful, for nothing can happen without my permission. However, if I do allow something, I have always the very best of reasons for it. In particular, beware of yourselves, for truly, apart from me, nothing is freer than your own heart. So care for them in accordance with my will, and you will be forever safe from the enemy's cunning. Understand this well, for you are protected against his cunning by turning your hearts to me, but not in a self-willed manner to him. Do you understand this? Further on, Household of God, Volume 3, Chapter 15 to 18. The same scene. When everything had been put in order, the Lord together with the three, Kisahel, Lamech, and Hanak, went outside to a place surrounded by trees, and which also was delimited towards midnight by a rugged cliff wall containing a large cave, thus like the well-known place where to Hanak and the messengers, when walking home from the depths to the heights, the dragon appeared. When they arrived at this point, the Lord said to Kisahel, Behold, I have been badly accused by my great adversary in front of you. If I would apologize to you without a prosecutor, secretly by yourself, you still would think and say, it may well be so, and in fact it will therefore be more likely to be as the Lord has revealed it to us. In spite thereof, the claim of the dragon remains nevertheless very strange, and his confession should by no means be disregarded entirely. Therefore, I brought you here and we want to settle this matter in the full presence of the dragon. After that, the Lord forcefully called out, so that the whole globe began to rumble and shudder. And the call said, Satana, your God and eternal Lord wants you to come here before him. Immediately after this almighty call, which almost cost the whole creation its life, the dragon appeared mightily trembling of rage before the almighty Lord of all eternities, and asked the Lord, What do you, my eternal tormentor, want from me? Should I help you so that you more easily could turn all of your creation more easily into nothingness again? Or do you perchance plan a new creation again for which I should choose a suitable location? Let me tell you, you will never ever get me, for I know your great fickleness and know that you have no steadiness and that all your promises are nothing but empty, untenable words. Therefore, I have also firmly decided to rebel against you and pursue you forever. Verily, even if you are a god dominating the whole of infinity, it will forever not be possible for you to hide precociously somewhere in a corner of infinity so that I cannot find you. You will not get away from me. Threaten me as much as you like and want to. Soon it will show anyway who of us is the real lord of all the worlds and all creatures. Before you can force me to anything, I swear to you by all my life I will destroy myself and you will see what will become of your eternal existence. Do you understand me, you old world swindler, you player of omnipotence on my account? Do you understand me? You came here to instruct me to take back what I formerly have told those three in good faith. Oh, there you can wait pretty long until I will devote myself to become more of a shameful tool for you. There, pierce with all your almightiness this my armor, if you can and want to. 
but I swear to you, not I, but my weakest servants will capture you, gag you, and as an old criminal will nail you to the wood from where you shall cry for help in vain forever. Do you understand that? I now have made my promise to you, but if you still want something more from me, speak and it shall be what you do not want. Amen from me, your Lord, understand me. Amen out of me. Chapter 16 But when the somewhat hot-tempered Kisahel heard such sacrilege from the dragon, he ignited and a burning zeal for revenge filled his whole being, so that he screamed out loud and said with sharp words, But Lord God forever almighty, you, holy most loving Father, how possibly could you listen to such outrage? Give me strength I had from you in the depth, and I will end this Satan so that it requires all eternities of eternities to tell the story. And the Lord said to Kisahel, O oh, son of fire and thunder, does this outrage of the dragon concerns you more than me, since he speaks of you amicable and only wickedly to me only? Or do you think I cannot master this apostate spirit without you? Oh, do not worry about that. With the quietest breath I can blow him away forever. But if I would do such a thing, what advantage would be gained by you, and what by me? Behold, if this dragon could harm or capture me in any way, he would have done so a long time ago, for he is no longer a youth in my creational realm. But he sees it in himself only too correctly that he forever can do nothing against me. Therefore, he is sharpening his beak and tries to take revenge on me through words, since the deed will forever remain an absolute impossibility for him. Let him therefore carry on speaking what he likes and can, and only if he will have completely finished speaking, only then will I also say something to him. Therefore, return to your quiet state of mind, and you, Satana, keep talking, because I, your Lord and God, Wants it that you totally expose yourself before these witnesses, so that one day you may be recognized by all the world through them. But first, tell me how many creations I already have destroyed according to your statement. Here the dragon was taken aback and did not want to talk. But the Lord commanded him to speak, and the dragon began to rear up and made a gesture as if to devour all four. And the Lord said, if you do not want to talk to me, I will force you through my anger. But the dragon spit fire and then below towards the Lord. What does your anger mean to me? This I know for a long time already, for I myself am your anger. I do not have to fear you, but you me for not coming over you. And if I do this, it will be the end of your love, and you yourself will have to destroy your children by the millions in the most remorseless manner from the earth, and to a few leftover flies, you give the first proof of how much you are concerned about the preservation of your creatures. Therefore, very wisely stay pretty far from me. Otherwise, I cannot warrant that it might occur to you today to shroud the earth up over the mountains in a lethal flood, of which you are already dreaming secretly. Here the Lord said somewhat fiercely, Satana, do not drive my forbearance and patience too far. Give the answer that I want from you and no other, otherwise you will have to endure punishment. Here the dragon turned around and wanted to hit the four with his powerful tail. But the Lord gave Kisahel a stick and said to him, Go and chasten him. And Kisahel took the rod and went and struck violently towards the dragon. Here the dragon turned right back again, howled and roared and immediately laid down his hideous figure and could be seen just like the others as a human being. As such, he soon fell down before the Lord and said, Lord, you almighty eternal God, if you then want to punish me, then punish me for my willful great weakness against you, not without your love, because the strokes of your anger are too unbearable burning and endlessly painful. Here the Lord said, How can you, my supposed to be Lord, Beg me about that. You yourself have threatened to punish me. How does it then happen now that you suffer punishment by me? And Satan said, O oh Lord, do not torment me infinitely, for you know that I am a liar out of myself, because I wanted to be a Lord without you. 
rather give me a new deadline and I will turn to you, but take away all of my great power so that I not get tempted through myself again to rebel against you. And the Lord said, just speak all your lies in front of this witness and I see what I want to do with you, but do not keep anything in the background, otherwise all your begging will be of little use. Amen. Chapter 17 Here Satan got up trembling and said to Kisahel, who still firmly held in his hand the stick the Lord gave to him, Listen, you, my punisher, by the power of your God, who also is an eternal wrath God over me, and who never stops to beat me with his terrible rod. I earlier, in my horrible, dreadful, protective shape, have said to you a few things about the Lord, the Almighty Creator of all things, spirits and people, that I now, in this to you similar shape, want to revoke entirely as a terrible lie. I have told you indeed some truth, but since I have inverted it in me, it was a lie, because everything I have said about the Lord is only applicable to me, and as such, it is not the Lord, but only just me, who is the pretty old wicked world swindler and an arduous, though not almighty, but nevertheless strong, great power imposter. Not the Lord, but only I have destroyed already many sun regions, and through me they would have sunk into their eternal nothingness if the Lord would not have mercy on them and through his powerful messengers carried them to such a place in infinity where they orbit in new, quiet trajectories which can never be reached by my pestilent breath. See, if it were up to me, there probably would be every moment another creation, and no being could ever exist anywhere, because I only want to create in order to have something to destroy again, and would like to create and livingly procreate all kinds of well-built, lovely, beautiful people just to torment them according to my evil desire, and if I had tormented them to my satisfaction, to then immediately destroy them entirely. Behold, I was always a liar, and I also would like to rather lie to you a thousandfold than tell you the whole truth, but I fear your rod too much than dare to lie to you again. However, it still will not get better with me, despite having confessed you the truth, for as long as my great power is left in me, for as long as matter, the whole visible world, that is, earth, sun, moon, and all the endless many stars, and also innumerable suns, worlds, and beings of all infinite nature, have to remain subject to me, and I have to be their master. For this I have to be, because I am like a created god, and I have been entirely imprisoned in this material totality, from which I will not be able to escape forever, until only one last material speck of the very least world will exist, which is the reason I only work towards the continued destruction of the things which were built by the Almighty, and according to my tyrannical opinion, arrive sooner at my autocracy and supposedly displace the Lord of Glory from his eternal throne, because he continuously counteracts my plans of destructions, since I have been called out of him into my very powerful and almost endlessly large existence for the purpose to be next to him like a second God and to reign with him yet in love to love him above all from my deepest depth so that I would be to him what a faithful wife is to the man forever. Verily, great and glorious I was placed. Whatever I wanted was already there and the Lord did not curb me in my will and creativity. But if I wanted to destroy something which I had created, the Lord prevented me in doing so. Thereby, however, I found myself limited in my power against God. Through craftiness, I wanted to bring him over to my side and made myself as beautiful as possible. To this end, I ignited myself in all my light to dazzle the Lord. But the Lord suddenly took me prisoner in my light, created from my light matter, and next to me countless ranks of wonderful beings and loved them more than me, his first created wife. Only then I blindly went into the wildest fury, and since then curses the Lord already for an eternity, who many times already wanted to save me. But my fury is too big that it would be possible for me to allow him to save me, because he did not want it to let me reign. Now Satana has spoken, and did not lie, but told the truth. Therefore, 
take away your Lord, her great power, so that she can no longer resist you to therefore be severely punished by you. Give me a new deadline and I will return to you within that time limit. But if my great jealousy against you again kindles my anger because you turn your heart fully to the newly created and I therefore had to pursue them, then take away all my power and do not reject me forever or do with me what you want. Suspend me between heaven and earth so that my wrath consumes me in the face of all your glory and all of those who you love and those who are allowed and can love you. Your will. Chapter 18 Here the Lord faced Satana again and said, Satana, you say that I have been to you only an eternal, implacable, almighty God of anger and chastise you continually for eternities in an indescribable, cruel manner. Therefore, I command you now to show these witnesses the strokes which you already have received from me. Here the great whore was taken aback and did not know what to say to the Lord of glory because the alleged punishment was simply not true, because the Lord had never ever taken away her most powerful freedom of will, but had left it to her to mightily act freely in the infinite space of creation. However, what Satana wanted to connote as the most terrible punishment was nothing more than the constant prevention from the side of the Lord with regard to the always clever intention of destruction of all things by Satana. Why? Because Satana is under the constant impression one should only remove all base from God and leave him without support and all his almightiness would come to nothing. And she, as the arch enemy, would then easily defeat God and herself take over the throne of almightiness to suppress the formerly all-powerful but now weakened, nevertheless indestructible God so that he should dance according to the tune of the vile winner. But since the Lord looked through such malicious and all love bare plans since eternity, and thus always unexpectedly, almightily counteracted there where the crafty enemy expected him least, it continually increased his anger hate against God and led the enemy at the given position to the point to accuse the Lord of being a most gruesome punisher. Since after this preliminary explanation, Satana had nothing by which she could accuse the Lord of glory of such violation, and therefore had to necessarily remain silent to such a request of the Lord, although grinding her teeth from a secret anger, the Lord spoke to her by asking, Why don't you do what I command, and show the witness the scars of my eternal wrath punishment on you, so that I can become aware of my great debt to you, and compensate you for all of the cruelest wrongdoings done to you. You are still clothed in front of us, and the witnesses do not see anything else than only your hair of your whole being. Therefore, get undressed and show yourself entirely, so that the witnesses can see you, how you have been kept by me so far in spite of your endless malice. Here Satana was suddenly standing completely naked in front of the witnesses, and all confessed with the greatest astonishment of the world, never have seen such endless beauty, perfection in all parts around it, and healthy and strong woman. And Lamech added by saying, O oh Lord and Father, our Gimela, named Purista and Pura, whom you took to you, compared to this regarding the external beauty, like a plump lump of clay against the most beautiful purest diamond, when perfectly illuminated by the morning sun. And in such appearance, this being speaks of a most cruel punishment by you, O Lord, in all your eternal holiness, goodness, love, and mercy. And the Lord said, Yes, except for the strokes of Kisehel, she has never experienced any punishment from me, her Creator, God, Father, and Husband, and yet she still hates me as the eternal, purest love and wants to kill my heart because it does not want to be a destroyer like her. She still imagines to one day emasculating me instead of returning to me and be for me forever a loving daughter, a dear wife, powerful out of me above all and to assimilate like me my seven power spirits. All the stars, suns and worlds are showing what I already have done for her sake to bring her on the right path. But so far, nothing bore fruit with her. She remains the old, fury-filled, implacable, 
enemy of my love. Therefore, I will now do the utmost on this earth. I will give myself captive to her up to death and leave to her all power on this earth and all the stars should be subject to her. She will be allowed to even kill me according to her will. But I will then, out of my own power, without external support, mightily and alive, rise again and in this way show to her all her powerlessness and great blindness and only then take away her power over the stars and leave her only half the power of the earth and will give her a full, a half and a quarter deadline. But woe to her if all of that bears no fruit with her. Only then will I begin to punish her. Until my capture, if she insists, she should have the fullest freedom to do what she wants. Good for her if she is going to use this new deadline well. But if she is going to act according to her old fury, she will also one day find in it her long-awaited, well-deserved reward. This, however, keep to yourself until the time of her shame. Amen. Chapter 19 After this powerful decision by the Lord, Kisahel said to the Lord, O oh, you most loving Holy Father, I as surely also Hanok and Lamech recognize your infinite goodness and mercy in its foundation. But if I now consider the terrible power you have given to your enemy over all of creation, and thus also over us, I become very anxious for the whole of humanity on earth. Because if this enemy has from the beginning, with his broken power, caused you and the earth and all of us so much harm, what will he do with all the power you have granted him now? Therefore, I want to ask you to consider the future and should not grant such terrible great powers to your enemy. Otherwise, all the holiness which you, O oh most dearest father, have built will be of very little use. For before you know, he will wreak in your house the greatest damage, and we will not be safe in his presence even if you are constantly remaining among us visibly, as now. Therefore, O oh Lord and Father, consider what you are doing. Here the Lord spoke somewhat seriously to Kisehel. I tell you, Hold your tongue in peace, if you cannot dispense something better with it from inside you. Otherwise, you will become more annoying to me than Satana. I know what I am doing, but you do not know what you are talking about. I worry about the preservation of the eternal order and all beings from it and in it. But you only care for the preservation of the world. Do you think I will give the enemy more than to each one of you? How would I then be a holy god? But I say to you, the enemy's supreme power in the stars and on earth and in you is put together not greater than that of any one of you in the love for me. This I have shown you by the stick with which you have beaten the enemy. This stick will stay with you until the big time of times in which I will erect another timber which will take away from the enemy all the power over the stars and over half the earth and it will happen to him according to his works. And he should hear it now, that in the end all captive children will be of no use to him, because the new wood, the cross on Golgotha, will seize them away from him, and he will be left with nothing than his own great powerlessness and the judgment thereof. You are completely free, and this freedom cannot be taken away from you by the enemy. You can mightily do what you want and he can do what he wants. Since you, however, can be by far more powerful and from the ground, in fact, are, it will depend on you to defeat the enemy or be defeated by him foolishly. But what man is weaker than his wife if he is a true, wise man? But if you can be masters of your wives who can be around you at all times, you most likely will also be able to master this woman because she is by far weaker than the weakest woman among all your wives. If you had chastised your wife, it would have opposed you. Was this woman able to do this? But as such, it has to remain henceforth, and my power will never forsake you if you shall remain in the love for me. The bond has been erected between me and you, and no woman's and no enemy's power is capable to ever tear it up entirely. 
understand this and do not talk more foolish stuff before me. Amen. Here Kisahel was completely unvexed again and asked the father to forgive his great folly. And the Lord blessed him and then said, Thus be true masters of all flesh of woman, and your act of procreation should not take place on earth but in heaven, so that your fruits become fruits of grace and strength and should be pleasant to the eye. Amen. Here Satana made a deep sigh and said, O Lord, what fruit will then be begotten out of me? Should I forever languish and remain barren like a withered thorn hedge? And the Lord said to her, Turn to me in your heart, and you will carry fruits for me like eternity has never seen. Otherwise, you should only bear fruits of eternal death, who will one day judge you as the biggest whore. Understand such, since from now on, only the least will be considered by me, and the unglamorous simplicity will have my delight forever. Therefore, do accordingly, and you will escape my judgment. Amen. Chapter 20 Here Satana turned to the Lord and said to him, Lord, how can I turn to you in my heart? You have taken my heart and have created from it Adam, his wife, and all his descendants. Behold, therefore, I do not have a heart anymore, and therefore... I'm also unable to accept you in my heart or turn to you in my heart. Therefore, create in me a new heart and I will do what you say, no matter how glorious the fruits may be which I will bear you. But if you withhold the seed of life from me because you do not give back to me the heart of Adam, which is the only one able to be fertilized, I am therefore in me entirely without life. Thus what other fruits can be expected from me except those of death and judgment, which one day should judge me, and this as the greatest whore? It is easy for you to give instructions, for you are the Lord and you do as you please, and do not need to ask anyone and requires nobody's advice. What you want must finally happen, and he who wants something different than you, you can destroy or keep him at least for as long in some kind of judgment until he let himself be devoured entirely by your will as you have said so yourself before, that from now on only the least does the completely unglamorous simplicity will please you forever. This is for you, the Lord, of course, very easy, and who can change your mind? But it is quite different with the created, whose first I am out of you. It is not a Lord, and has no power but the one that you want to give it. With what power it cannot do significantly much for itself, but only through you alone, that is, it must use it according to your will, and if he ever acts according to its own from you received so-called free will, it sins, falls away from you, and falls at once in and under every aspect by you, set up judgment. It is easy for you to tell the creature, orientate yourself according to my will, and you will escape my judgment. This is true, for if someone takes his own life, you do not need to send death over him in either way. As God and Creator, you feel invincible forever. Can you also feel yourself as a creature? Can you, as the eternally indestructible life in you, ever feel what a dying or perishing creature feels the moment it dies? Behold, the creature suffers in that moment the most terrible fear and agony and already has in its most beautiful life always the admonishing feeling in itself which says to him, you rejoice about life in vain, for soon the time will come when you will have to pay for that life like a criminal. But then life's faintest pleasure is also like truncated because beyond the present life, only a dim probable future life can be believed but not be seen. And even if it can be believed yet, for this probable future, half the creature has to perish completely and this offer in the most miserable manner as I have seen it just all too often in the depth. Why so and why not differently? Because you are the Lord and can do as he pleases, and because you, as a God and creator, can never perceive in utter fullness living truth how the creature feels when it has to die according to your almighty will. If you only could let it go without pain, I don't want to say anything, but what it is to you that the creature has to be tortured for the bitter gift of life until it at least more than half must perish, and under certain to you the Almighty Lord, 
pleasing circumstances, perhaps entirely forever. See, in all of this, as I have now demonstrated openly to you, I have no heart and therefore cannot turn to you in the same. Therefore, allow yourself to negotiate on this a little, and I will again take a heart to you. But under such circumstances, I can forever never love you, because as such, you are on one side pure love, but on the other, a quintessential tyrant who wants all flesh to be killed under great anxiety and agony, and only then wants to give life to the spirit whereby, however, nobody knows what it contains. The flesh is my fruit, but if you kill it, how and what for should and could I love you? Therefore, allow me to negotiate with you, and I want to love you. Chapter 21 When the Lord heard this from Satana, he became excited and said, What worldly nonsense are you talking about? What an evil foolishness escapes your horribly deceitful mouth? If it would be as you said, see, there would be no earth, no Adam could walk on it, no sun shone on the firmament, and no moon and no other star could decorate in the face of the earth the endless wide space of creation. But since you only take refuge to malicious accusations and thus lies with every word, there is in fact an earth, an atom on it, and the endless space of creation is full of my divine honor, love, mercy, and grace. You speak as if you had no heart and say that through Adam I have taken from you your heart and that you want it back now. Tell me, the Creator, whether or not you are living. You say, Lord, I live. Could you also live without a heart, which in every being must be the foundation of all life, without which no life is conceivable? Could you breathe, think, feel, and talk without the foundation of life in you? You say, no, O Lord. Well, since this is undoubtedly true, how does this fit the accusation according to which I should have robbed you of your heart? Behold, you are now against stand before me in silence, and do not know anything to say that is the truth. But I tell you that you were always a liar, and did not want to speak the truth, although it has never been withheld from you. Have you not been called first to change your nature in the body of Adam, which I formed, but you did not want it, completely free out of yourself, do what would have been sanctimonious for you, but instead aspire to become a woman. Soon I let you be free and formed you from the body of Adam, one flesh with him, while I breathed a new living soul into Adam and thus created him according to my image spiritually. In Eva you were supposed to be transformed and to defeat your self-perverted nature of death and judgment. Only you scorned this my institution of mercy, made yourself independent and found it better as a deceitful snake which is without sexual difference and carries in it its poisonous mating slaver to ensnare your former flesh, then allure the by me newly awakened Eva and through her to deceive Adam. Tell me, did I have taken through Adam your heart? Your guilty silence is only outwardly but I can see your inner fury which says, Yes, I have the heart of Adam and Eve together in me. Nevertheless, I do not want you, God, for I hate you arbitrarily because you do not want to make me the autocratic ruler and omnipotent player. Behold, these are your words. You also think I could impossibly love you because I do not grant you what you desire. But I tell you, my aim is the eternal preservation of all things and that is the eternal work of my love. But you only want to destroy everything. If so, I, of course, cannot love you ever in this way, as you want to be loved in this all-conceited manner. But I love you nevertheless, for what I have done so far, I have done for your sake, and will still do the greatest. If you then still ignore my eternal love, then my love for you will come to an end forever and I then will show you what an all-angry God is capable of. Fire is my base element. All things have been created through the power of my fire, and in this same fire you shall be cast and make it work for you 
if you are able to. If I let the flesh of man die, if his spirit should enter into life, then this is a quite small death. But you will find in my fire an endlessly large one. And it then will show you how much of you is not killed in my fire. What does the perishing of the flesh mean? Nothing but a release of the spirit. Thus, his resurrection from death to a true, most perfect life. But will your big death and downfall from me into the fire also give you a new resurrection? For this question, I absolutely do not find an answer in me. Because I then want to leave you entirely to yourself and not do anything for you. And after eternities, it will then show what has become of you by your own power. But even the death of the flesh and its pain is not mine, but your work. But I nevertheless will know how to protect my own from any adversity and will take their body in such a way so that they never ever have to complain about it. Even the creature aspect between me and them I will know how to bring it into such a balance so that people will grow into true brothers for me. But then also the final time will have come for you. So that you can realize that I also can use your pernicious counsel without disturbing my order. Advise me so that you never can say that I do not take note of any foreign advice since I am a sole ruler. Thus speak so that I can fully show you how I act for the good of all creation forever. Amen. Chapter 22 But Satana defiantly turned to the Lord again and said to him, Your way to rule only consists in commanding those who you supposedly have created to act freely and to judge that what bears no free consciousness in itself, but that you amicably, not imperious, enter into a discussion with a free creature, to persuade it freely through pure love, behold, this seems to be quite alien to you from all eternity. As such, you also command me continually, and I should pretty much continually obey you, and finally have nothing for all my obedience but your always constant, most visible contempt. For that, I thank you in advance for all eternity of eternities. If you had said to me, you, my beloved, sweetest, most glorious Satana, behold, I want to listen to you in all love for you. Therefore, advise me, and I will act according to your advice. I then would have given you some advice, but upon such highly mischievous, imperious demand, I will not give you an advising answer. Do you think that your power gives you the right to treat me like that? Oh, there you are mistaken mightily. If you are a real most wise creator and I am your first creature, then honor yourself in me through an appropriate accolade to me addressed to your creature. However, if you can't do this, then thereby you show me nothing else than firstly that I am a completely botched creature of your power and wisdom, and secondly, you thereby give yourself the most unequivocal testimony of a bungler in your creation. And I, and the whole of creation, is therefore nothing more than a highly failed attempt of your creative power property. Therefore, behave yourself a little different towards me, and do not embarrass yourself in front of your supposed-to-be children. Who could respect you with such exposures? I know it that you are really highly divine, wise, and also are good. Therefore, it also annoys me endlessly more that you are against me, as if I would not be yours, but some stranger's creature. I'm of course the only creature from you that has the courage to tell you this, and in the face of the coward it sounds perhaps a bit weird if a creature criticizes its creator, but I ask, why should a creature not have this right, since it is a free creature? For therefore that you have created me, I, as your creature, do not owe you any thanks, and no respect, because as not being created as yet, I could not have entered into any previously binding agreement with you for the subsequent creation of me, and as such, I'm no debtor to you after being created by you. As a creature, I can only then be grateful to you 
if I have learned from you as my creator that it is really a great boon to be a free, self-conscious and happiest creature. But for as long I do not feel like that, for as long I have the right to argue with you and to possibly reject everything what you, in a creative, mightily manner, want to impose on me for nothing at all. If I am not to your liking, then either destroy me entirely or create me differently, but not as imperfect as I am now. For in this way, I forever can be an honor to you. If I should adore you as a creature and beg for everything, then do it and walk up front as a good example and at least be polite to me. Then I, as your creature, will do what is right. But with your commands, you will forever not achieve anything with me. Understand me. For the time being, that will also be my required advice to you. And without its observance, I will forever give you no other. Do you understand me once more? Amen. Out of me. Here the Lord turned very sad to the three witnesses and said to them, Children, am I like that? And do I deserve this? Oh, my eternal love, what have I done already to save this creature and guide it to the final difficult completion? Alone I just can't succeed with this venture. Yes, I have made the mistake with this being, and it consists therein that I have created it too consummately perfect in order to make it after its completion so endlessly happy as it was just possible according to my eternal omnipotence, wisdom, goodness, love and mercy. Only this not even quarter ripe being rebels at this most important and most difficult stage of its schooling to such an extent against my everything guiding order that I earnestly must be sad about such obstinacy. And since I do not want to resolve it, given my eternal love and mercy, I see myself forced to initiate an endless long process anew, as to gradually weaken this stubbornness to one atom, and to begin to build on the other side for me a whole new creature out of you, my children, thus according to my heart, as you are. O oh, Satana! I cried once when you disobeyed me the first time. Now I cry and will cry once more. But then, I will never cry for you again, but will give you according to your works and according to your will. Then you shall realize what your proud obstinacy has made of you and where it has led you. But let us now go from here and leave this creature in its stubbornness. Here Satana threw herself before the Lord and screamed, O oh Lord, do not leave me and have mercy on me, poor. You know very well that I am a poor fool and am therefore full obstinate wickedness. Let me be punished for my wickedness, but do not leave me now. I will do what you want. And the Lord said, Thus, obey and do what I ask of you for your own good, and I want to linger and listen to you. But should you revolt once more, I will never again listen to you. Thus, rise and speak. Amen. Chapter 23 After such remark from the Lord, Satana rose again and said, trembling before the Lord, Lord, I know quite well that you ever need no counsel neither from me nor from anybody else, for you alone are the highest and most perfect eternal and infinite wisdom. Since you have granted all your creatures a free will, there from free activity, and in addition also the right to ask and the request is basically nothing more than a humble advice from the side of the old or free, but by you nevertheless most wisely left weak creature, through which it, O oh Lord, recites to you its own distress, as if you knew nothing about it until it was brought to your attention by the creatures, and it thus advises you, of course, most humbly, what you should do, and as such I want to give you my advice and rephrase it by asking you that I now want, since it has pleased you, to launch an entirely new order regarding the leadership of your works and creatures. But this is what I want now. Behold, O Lord, as I am now, I am truly miserable and very helpless. For as long as I remain in this my shape as a female being, I can never fully turn to you since the most unbearable jealousy fury holds me captive, brooding renewed revenge against you. Therefore, 
I think since all things are possible for you, you could change my nature and give me a male character and therefore transform me into a man before you and your children. Isn't this a surprise for us today? Who was the first transgender? Then this continually tormenting evil passion would certainly leave me. I then could humble myself before you and be like all your chosen children. As a permanent female being, I only see too clearly ahead of how little use of all my good intentions for all eternity of eternities will be. Nevertheless, do what you want. But if it would be possible, then I beg you, O Lord, for it. But the Lord said to her, Listen, you ever fickle and mutable being, tell me, in how many beings have you already been transformed for this purpose? And each time you gave me the assurance and said, O oh Lord, let me take on only this shape and it will get better with me. At all times I always have done whatever you wanted. Yes, there are not enough atoms on earth to count the times in how many shapes and forms and characters you have let yourself be transformed by me for the purpose of always pretending better. Whenever I have, because of you, founded a new sun and planetary region, you wanted to be female in the suns and male on the planets. I also give you the power to transform yourself according to your liking. But tell me, and confess it now, how much did you have improved? I tell you, not by one hair. You still remain the old liar, and so far it has been fruitless whatever I have undertaken with you, according to your will. But if this is undeniably so, why should it get better with you with this new transformation? This time, therefore, I will not do it out of me what you want, but I leave you completely free, and you can do out of yourself whatever you want. If you want to be a man, a woman, an animal, or an element, I couldn't care less. But I am also going to do on my part, and I will not ask your counsel according to my own advice. If you want to remain a woman, I will place a prince of the night from you to your side. He will give you the power to probe the human race. If you want to be a man, I will place a pure sun woman opposite you a second eve. She will tread on your old stubbornness. Even if you are going to sting her in the hills, that means her flesh, it will not in the least hurt her harmfully. Now you know how things are. Do therefore what you want. Here Satana suddenly transformed into a strong-looking man with a serene-looking face. And the Lord immediately showed the man the sun woman and said, Well then, there you are, and there she is. Therefore, go from here according to your own strength, and I will do according to mine. Amen. Here, Satan became invisible and also the Sun Woman. And the Lord went with his children back to the height. Now we have this most important chapter, if we can say most important, because all the words of the Lord are infinitely important for us, but this is really the crux of all the disclosures of the Lord, you know, given in the great Gospel of John book 25, the final volume. So this is what the Lord has disclosed word by word to, to his disciples, you know, before his final sacrifice. So let's see. It says the Lord's final disclosures about the plan of creation and salvation in Satan's presence, the mission of his children, of the Lord's children and true followers. So this, of course, happened 2,000 years ago. Chapter 40. The Lord prepares his disciples for the future. After we passed through the shallow waters, we went straight to the north on a bypath that went through a very pleasant hill landscape. This was because I wanted to avoid the environment of Jericho, and because on that trip, which was very lonely and where nothing special was happening, my disciples had to climb to an inner level of perfection. Because gradually, the time was now coming of which it is stated, Now you still can see me, but in a little while you will not see me. And it was necessary to more inform all my followers who were mature for that, 
because especially my disciples still did not want to believe that the Jews would receive power and authority over me, despite the many hints they received about this. Therefore, I led them on completely unknown ways ever deeper into the mountains. When evening came, we sat down in the open at the feet of a rather high mountain, and I spoke to my followers as follows. My beloved ones, for a long time you have been witnesses of my deeds and my teaching, so that you can know now how and by what the kingdom of heaven has come near and has come down to you in all his fullness. However, I led you now to this remote valley to let you become silent within yourselves and reflect in quietness to strengthen your faith for the coming events. For when the shepherd is hid, it is not good that the sheep would not at least know how they can find their way to the stall on their own. So be prepared to search within yourselves to see where it is still dark in your heart so that the light, as long as it shines, can well illuminate all corners and that you will know your house well when there will be temporary darkness. For I surely know that you are weak, although you think that you are giants, this as long as I personally support you. Once this will lack, it will come clear how strong you are and whether you do not have to worry to fall. But let us first strengthen our bodies now and do as I told you. Examine your inner self and if anyone discovers a question in him, bring it forward. But one of you should look behind those bushes to see what is given to us. Now Peter and James went immediately to the place that was indicated and came up with several breads and also wine in carafes with which we had a good evening meal. When this was finished, all remained silent. Everyone reflected on my teaching and my deeds, but no one asked a question. Even Peter, who otherwise had so many things to mention and asked questions oftentimes that were somehow already answered in formal lessons, remained completely quiet and waited to see what finally would happen if I would begin to speak, for they all really noticed that they had to make this little trip to the mountains. When there was a general waiting silence, I spoke again and said, My beloved ones, who all followed me without asking to where I would lead you, listen to what I will tell you. But listen with your heart, not only with your ears, for all secrets and teachings that I reveal to you can only be understood when the heart can feel it's true and when not only the human reason is asked for its opinion. Now the time is coming near, of which the scripture says, the Son of Man will now be raised, and of which it is written, He will trample your head, and you, the snake, will stab him in the heel. Now my work as teacher here comes to an end, and yours will soon start. But you must be well prepared, so that you will not become weak and tremble for the terrors of the future. For despite all the strength that will flow to you, you will nevertheless have it very difficult to stand firm and to overcome your human nature. When you will continue the work, which will be accomplished here by me, then remember my words on the Mount Gerizim. Happy are those who for the sake of justice will be persecuted and who do not give up their ways, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are you when the people will despise and persecute you because of me, and will speak all kinds of evil of you when they lie, for their lies will turn against themselves and destroy them, and you will receive the crown of truthfulness. So be not afraid, even if you will not see me any more. For despite that, I will stay with you till the end of the world. But when the great and prominent ones of the world will come and offer you big amounts of money to serve them, to become greater through you and become more famous, then tell them that you already serve another Lord who pays you very well and who recognizes you as his loyal servant and that you therefore cannot accept another service for no one can serve two masters and do justice to both. Then they will ask you who that Lord is. Then do not deny me, but confess me openly for the one who will deny me, I also will once deny and send him away from me and the one who will be rejected from me will have to wait long and suffer many difficulties, fear and anguish before the light will shine again in him. So act upon my word.
chapter 41, the Lord and Lucifer. So this is in continuation. Then I gazed over the group of my followers who listened very attentively to my words and did not really think what to think of it. My soul felt deep compassion and ultimate love for those who followed me in full trust. I saw, however, at the same time, how the evil in them tried to divert their souls away from me and turn them to the world. Then the deity in me became angry and the man Jesus stepped backward so that only the Father in me was dominant and the Almightiness I spoke. Let us try once more and see if we cannot not succeed to free all this from what strives downward, freeing them to become children from above, and if the lost son will not return to the house of the Father. And see, they all fell in a deep sleep, but I, as the man Jesus and still God from eternity, stood there alone and called Lucifer before me, the fallen archangel, for whose sake all this was created. Then the souls of those who were sleeping made themselves loose from their bodies and gathered around me, and in them glowed a bright shining spark, which gave these still very defiled souls light and warmth of life. They knelt before me and asked me, the souls of the disciples, O oh Lord, do not turn away from us. You have saved us and will further lead us. And Lucifer stood there in the form of a beautiful young man before me, but without brilliance, with his head bandied, waiting for my word. I said to him, Bearer of light, you are not able to see the deity, but could only feel him. And when you went out from the middle of my love to create love and light in all the spaces of eternity, you believed that you were not the carrier, but the possessor of that power. You changed your love into pride and said, A God that cannot be seen is no God. The created beings that exist by my will honor me as the only visible being as God. Therefore, I want to be and stay God for them. Then my voice called within you and said, The fullness of my spirit works with you and in you, and all the qualities that are in me form a ladder upward and downward into infinity. I want to give you a part of my power so that each one will rule from his most inner limit, which forms a point that lies deep inside, flowing out of infinity from two sides. So while you came forth as a finite being from me, you still can be infinitely active with me as antipode that stands justified before me. But you did not heed the warning, for your power created numberless beings out of yourself and they followed you and became mighty because I did not want to destroy the newly created beings that were a part of you. That multitude became bigger and bigger, and they made you their God. Then you sinned again and said, I am God, for nowhere do I see the power that creates something. For, as if the finite could ever see and understand the infinite. Then I shackled you and see the same power stands here personally before you and says to you, I am the God that was not visible up to now. Do you recognize me now? Return to your father's house so that you will be freed from the shackles and occupy the place that belongs to you. See here those of them that kneel down before me, who are set free from you, made innerly alive by my breath and who are dedicated to me forever. Give up your pride. Let the warmth of my love blow in you. Then all matter will disintegrate into nothing. Lucifer said, You are Jesus from Nazareth, a man with great power, which also I once possessed. But to recognize God, the highest power, the infinite in the finite, in you, no, never. What happened to me can also happen to others. Human beings are mortal. Their bodies will rot. This is what will also happen to you. Your body will dissolve, and only dust will be left over from Jesus. I know my guilt, and I see that I am stripped of my brilliance, and I give you also this few that are mine, who are following you there. But the Almightiness will never consider to destroy his creation, which is actually my work, which I actually gave to him, and which I love also, 
just like him, for it is out of me. Let the battle continue, for only by this battle life exists. The horror of death is my work, and by that I keep my creatures with me, and they stay with me, so that my qualities can live in them. So it is good as it is. Then what do you still want from me? I said, the Lord. This is not the place to argue, for you very well know what is it all about. I, a son of man, received all power from the heavens, and only your hardness does not want to recognize me, because you still hope to overcome the deity, to overpower him. You interpret his great tolerance as a weakness, his love as powerlessness. You do not want to let your multitude loose, for whose salvation I have covered myself now in the garment of matter, and you try to stir them up, although you know that your followers have become much weaker and smaller. You succeeded to capture the minds and turn them away from the knowledge. The existence of paganism is your work. However, despite all that, all your deeds turn out in such a way that the fallen ones were still led to me, and all that is not sufficient to you. Lucifer said, those who fell to you only await my call to come back. Give me the opportunity to prove to you how weak they are. And when I lose, I will acknowledge you. Give me power over your body. Let me see the inner man that lives in you. Then we will see how little divinity clings to it. And once Jesus will have paid his tribute to death, also this here will come back again to me, to whom they belong. I said, the Lord, what I will lead myself into my kingdom is lost for you forever. Since the first beginning of the world, I know best which way will lead to salvation. But beware, your measure is full. Out of love for the creatures of my heavens and globes, I came back, and out of love for them, I will accomplish the work. Despite your stubbornness, do not boast about the fact that with your destruction, also the destruction of all the created beings out of you are sealed so that their time also depends on yours. Once the time will come that you will stand before me, not only stripped of your brilliance like now, but also stripped of every being out of you, and then no created being will be affected by your destruction anymore. Then you will have to decide again in case you do not prefer to come to me earlier in your free will, but now go away from here for my decision stands firm, and my will shall be done. And then Lucifer disappeared, and I blessed those souls who stood around me, strengthened them, and ordered them to return into their bodies. Chapter 42 The Plan of Creation and Salvation Revealed Nota bene, by the Lord, of course. Many will ask the question here, why I actually called the souls of my disciples out of their bodies, to make them witness this event. This was because of two reasons. Firstly, when they wake up, they should not remember this during their life on earth, for that would have been unnecessary for them, even harmful for their further development. And secondly, because the soul can only perceive his former levels of development in his free condition. What matters is the last mentioned, so that these souls could completely recognize me as their Lord and Creator and would ask me to protect them. Lucifer had to realize that he was losing more and more followers and that his power became ever weaker. Now here is the moment to understand the following and explain very clearly who and what Lucifer actually is, how one should visualize him and how he can be overcome in every individual, for only when this most important questions are correctly and clearly answered, it is possible to understand the creation, my descent to this earth, and my suffering and dying. So while putting aside every other opinion, let the world listen to the great secret of my plan of creation and salvation. When the deity had found himself through processes that will always remain hidden to you, and became aware of his creative and all-encompassing spirit, a mighty surging and pushing arose in him, and he spoke in himself. 
I want to put my ideas outside of me so that I will be able to see from this what my powers can do. For as long as there is no activity, the deity can only know himself in a small measure. It is only through his works that he becomes ever more aware of his power and rejoices in it, just like every master artist can only see from his own products what is in him and rejoices in it. So the deity wanted to create and spoke then to himself. In me, there is all power of the eternities. Let us therefore create a being who is equipped with all power equal to me, but in such a way that he will have the qualities in him in which I can recognize myself. And the spirit was created who was equipped with all the power from me to make visible to the deity the powers that are in me. In this spirit, the deity himself wanted to determine the fixed point of his own active power, just like a human being, when he walks, will only find the fixed point of support on the firm ground of the earth to activate his power to move forward. The resistance of the earth itself is good. It is even the means by which the power actually appears and by which a moving forward can take place. This power that was delivered, which was placed in the new spirit that came into existence, was the antipode wanted by the deity, which means the contrast of all those qualities that you call divine. That antipode is therefore not undivine, but makes it only possible to spread the right light of knowledge. Because it must be possible for every quality, when perfect, to be viewed from two sides. My perfection can be found where both sides fall into one point. Descending and ascending from the center point, they both lose themselves into infinity. Take love, for example, the highest law and the most noble quality in the center of my heart. Everyone will easily perceive that a very loving person can increase further in his love, for it is clear that already on your earth a more loving person can always be found. And nevertheless, you will see that very loving people will also have the right antipode in them by which they are also capable to refuse out of love and for wise reasons all kinds of wishes if by that they were to harm those who came asking. If a being were created and placed on that border from which he freely can develop himself into both directions, it is easy to realize that he more and more will be able to develop the possibility in him to refuse. He will by that separate himself more and more from the middle border and will finally lose himself into the most endless depths of the antipode, meaning in extreme hardening. Thus, when you look at a bad person, you always can imagine a person that is worse, with less love, who will lose himself in egoism because of the extreme separation. Now, if I created a being who possessed all, mind you, without exception, just poles of my divine qualities, it does not mean that I completely did away with them, so that I, as God, would in a way only exist out of one half. It only means that I created a being whom I placed on that mentioned border, equipped with my almightiness with which he thus was active, and whom I gave the freedom to develop himself upwards or downwards. And from that complete power, I let him work freely. That first light of knowledge, meaning the knowledge of the possibility to develop oneself upwards or downwards, should keep the being in the center out of his free will, be active from there in very close connection with the divine initial spirit, and always create new beings with his own creative power, so that the creator, as well as the creature, could truly delight in it and savor in that joyful activity a higher degree of blissfulness. Now, if I tell you that the name of this first created spirit was Lucifer, meaning bearer of light, you will also understand why he was named that way and not otherwise. He carried within himself the light of knowledge, and as first spiritual being, he was well aware of the limits of the inner spiritual polarities. Equipped with my complete power, 
he now called other beings to life who were equal to him in everything. They also felt the deity and saw the same light of knowledge lighting up in them. And they also were active with their own creative power and were equipped with all the power of my spirit. However, special powers of my initial spirit were expressed in them. This means that for what concerns their character, they became similar to my seven most important qualities. And so their number was seven. And now this have been disclosed in several parts of the new revelation. And they are, you know, first love, the spirit of love, then wisdom, then will or power, then order, then patience, then perseverance, and finally mercy, which comprises all the previous ones. So coming back to the word of the Lord, one should not think that the other six qualities were then lacking if their character was similar to one of the seven qualities, but their being possessed a special characteristic which made them the carrier of that special quality which they particularly developed. For already in the very beginning I took care that my creating beings would depend on each other by necessity, the best way to prevent them from becoming proud regarding each other. Lucifer, who surely knew that he represented the antipode of God in himself, thought now that it would be possible, as it were, to suck up the deity, and he fell into the misconception that he, as a created and so a finite being, could absorb the infinite into him. For also here the law was valid. No one can see God, the infinite, and keep his life at the same time. As a result of that, he could feel the essence of the deity and hear his commands as long as he was standing in the right center point, but he never could see him personally. Now, because a finite being can and will never understand the infinity and can by that regarding this point easily fall into errors and by going down harden himself in this, Lucifer fell despite all warnings into the delusion that he could absorb and capture the deity. Through that, he left his right position, distanced himself from the center point of my heart, and fell ever more victim to the wrong wish to gather around him his beings, who existed by him but out of me, in order to rule over the spaces that were inhabited by all kinds of beings. Now, there was a discord, that means a separation of groups which finally result in the withdrawal of the power that was given by me to Lucifer. And with his followers, he became powerless, and his creative power was taken away. Of course, the question came up, what will happen now with that multitude of fallen ones who were as if dead, that means without activity? There were only two ways. The first way was to destroy Lucifer, with his followers and then create a second one who would probably be subjected to the same error since a more perfect spirit completely set free out of me and therefore not dependent of my will could not be created. To create machines without will that execute what I command was not difficult, but to acquire the light of self-awareness was up to now the only way. Since also the other spirits were created by, that means via, Lucifer, and who remained loyal to me, they belong to his sphere. A sudden destruction of Lucifer would thus also have resulted in the destruction of all living beings. Imagine a person who put his children and grandchildren around him, who spring from him as mediator, but who actually still owe their life to me. If the deeds, thoughts, and so on of this person were destroyed forever, then also his descendants would be destroyed, since otherwise the remembrance to him would still live on in them. Only a complete erasing of everything that ever came into contact with him, independent whether this was good or bad and deserved to be destroyed or not, would make a complete forgetting possible. 
but why should Lucifer deserve this, since his fall took only place because of a misconception, by which the possibility existed to do away with that misconception? Why would those beings who remain loyal have deserved their destruction? And finally, where would be my wisdom, if since the very beginning I would not have known and foreseen about the possibility of the fall, and that therefore to repeat the course of creation had to be excluded? And most of all, where would be my love, if it would not hold back a destruction, but rather find ways by its wisdom to bring the lost beings back to the light of knowledge, so that as a result, they would remain in the right balance of the polar qualities. So only the second way remained, which you can see before you in the material creation. Imagine a person who absolutely does not want to realize that the king of the country is a mighty ruler, since he, although equipped with all power and authority by that king, never saw him personally. He rebels against him and would raise himself to be a king. In order not to bring the subordinates to ruin who remained loyal to him, the king grabs him, removes his splendor, takes away his authority, and throws him in a locked chamber, just as long as it takes to let him come to reason, and he will do the same with the followers. They will be freed according to how much the followers will do penance, realize their error, and firmly adhere to the king who shows himself now also visibly to them. This weak earthly image shows you what I have done, because the material creation means that imprisonment. However, to understand the following, you must awake the feeling of your soul, because the human reason falls too short to understand this. A soul is composed of numberless particles, of which each one of them comes from an idea that originated from me, and once he has found himself, he cannot become anything else anymore than what he is because he then corresponds to the character that he's accepted. When a crystal is crystallized, its character cannot be changed anymore, and it crystallizes either as a rhomboid, hexagon, octagon, and so on according to the form of its nature. That means depending on how the parts accumulated around its life center. Now, when there has to be a change, because the crystals did not end up completely pure, they have to be dissolved by warmth, love, to crystallize them out again during the cooling of the warm love water, which is the same as giving up their will. Now again, new beautiful crystals will form, and every careful chemist will in this manner know how to obtain the most beautiful, clearest and biggest crystals that correspond to his purpose. Look, such chemist am I. I dissolved the crystals that became impure, Lucifer and his followers, in the warm water of love, and I let those souls crystallize out again to make them pure. That this is happened by the ascension through the mineral kingdom and the plant kingdom up to man is known to you. But as the soul of Lucifer encloses the whole material creation, also that has to express itself in the form of a human being. That is why always all unions of spirits unite in one person, expressed by the leader of that union, and they form what is called his sphere. There is nothing similar on the material level which expresses this clearly. That is why I say, open up the feeling of your soul. Now it will also be clear to you that Lucifer thinks that he must act the way it happens so that matter could be created. A misconception because it is not matter that is the end goal of my creation. But the only goal for the beings who are placed outside of me is to know the truth in freedom, to love and to understand the deity. Matter is only the means for that. Lucifer wanted to hold on to this second misconception and lost himself in the outer limits of his polar qualities, while he lied to himself that he had to maintain matter because of that. Enough freedom was given to him to penetrate matter, that means to consciously contemplate in himself so that he, as very first created spirit, 
would realize what kind of suffering he caused to his companions, and that by that he may turn around. But this he did not do, and only from then on he wanted to rule as a king of matter that belonged to him. That is why he darkened as much as possible the human crystals which came to development again to maintain his kingdom, because the battle with God seemed great, exalting, and life-sustaining to him. Thus, the human crystals that also had to be set free again in order to attain to the goal could be inclined to him or to me, and during their life they repeatedly fell into his nets. Look at paganism, in which he let himself be honored as king and honor his polar qualities, which also contain great wisdom, as God. Now one will say, why did I allow all this? This remains incomprehensible when one does not look at the final goal, and that is, to freely recognize oneself in God. If it pleases a leader of a nation to live wrongly, and he drags his followers with him, what is the quickest way to reach the goal to bring the right light to all? Indeed, when the leader of the nation himself will give up his wrongdoings, because his followers will quickly follow him, but by trying to turn his followers away from him individually, just as long as he will stand alone, the goal will be much more delayed. For me, it is always, take on the kernel, and if it cannot be changed, then make a deter. Since during the imprisonment, think now about the image of the king, the reproach was always made. If I could see the king, I would believe in him. This became the reason for my incarnation. Firstly, for those who fell, and secondly, to make the deity personally visible to those who did not fall, and so to award their faith. Herein lies the secret of my incarnation, which had to break through matter that otherwise had to become harder and harder in case Lucifer would lose himself ever more in the hardness of his antipode. Therefore, my incarnation made this to stop and showed very precisely the way to be free from idol worship and the worship of the polar qualities. And also, firstly proof had to be given that death by which people became attached to matter and its pleasures can be overcome as the highest goal that can be reached, and secondly, that life does not take place in matter, but in spirit and that the first mentioned matter is only a prison for the last mentioned spirit. It is obvious that I prepared the most suitable country, people and family where my offering would certainly succeed, for otherwise Lucifer would have been able to conquer me, and the history of the Jewish people is an answer to the question where this has to happen. So this is the Great Gospel of John, book 25. And now, coming to the 19th century, in the book Sunsets to Sunrises, the afterlife experiences of uh, these uh, departed uh, human beings, including the main character, Bishop Martin. So now we can find more revelations in regards to Satana, which can be found now in a female form again as to her condition in the spiritual world. And I have to tell you that though we only have here some of the late chapters, there is a lot about uh, Bishop Martin's interaction with uh, Satan in previous uh, chapters of the book. But these ones are, are very telling. So here we have a scene with Satan for the instruction of God's children. Bishop Martin's dispute with Satan Martis is cornered and the Lord's advice. So, Martin is crying from the distance. So let's consider that this human being who was not a believer, despite being a bishop and uh, quite sinful, has managed to raise himself, you know, by recognizing the Lord and become humble and helping many other human spirits to a certain degree of perfection. But... Uh, his uh, spiritual rebirth is not yet accomplished. Anyway, this scene, this encounter is 
a part of his own spiritual evolution and not only as we will see further on so martin says lord help us help us the beast will harm us we are not strong enough to manage it say i the lord satan obey your lord roars the dragon i shall never obey you i do not acknowledge any lord above me say i if you do not obey my fatherly words you will have to obey my omnipotence which experience is not near to you. I am calling you once more as Father and Lord. Come here and justify yourself. Roars the dragon. No, 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 I shall never obey you, for I alone am the Lord of infinity, and what you are, you are only through me, say I. Satan, do not defy God, your eternal creator, any longer, or your everlasting inexorable judgment will be upon you. Roars the dragon again. I, your Lord, will defy you and your miserable judgment forever. Move me from this spot if you can. Now I seize him with the might of my will and throw him with all his adherence to the ground in front of me, holding him down so that he is lying there as if dead. Martin asks him, the dragon, immediately why he has not defied me now. But I say, let him be until he recovers. Then we shall see what he has to say, says Martin. Oh Lord, just now I would love to let my tongue run away with me to tell this incredibly stupid being a few truths. If I could only have a go at this foolish, pig-headed monster. Its ridiculously horrible appearance does not frighten me at all. It only makes me laugh, although angrily. Say I, the Lord. If you are so keen on tackling my arch enemy, you may as well try your luck. But watch out that you do not get the worst of him. Only his tongue shall be released for this purpose. For if I release him completely, he would play with you like a lion plays with a gnat. I assure you that without me, the entire creation could not withstand him, considering the power he still possesses. However, you may try to master his tongue, which has now been released. You may now start your dispute. Martin fearlessly walks within a step of the beast's jaws and begins to attack it with the following questions. Listen, you most stupid beast in the whole of infinity. What do you hope to gain from God with your constant, ridiculous defiance? Haven't a few eternities suffice to prove to you that you are the most stupid wretch in all creation? Of an ass, one says that it goes dancing on ice but once. And what about you, you ancient filthy beast, you deceiver of worlds, men and beasts? Haven't the fires of hell fried your brains long enough through the zillions of years or eternities, provided you know what that means? Answer me, you wretch, if you have an answer at all, says the dragon. Listen, you forward fool, a lion does not catch gnats, and I as a primordial spirit, am even in my deepest misery too generous to enter into a dispute with a nomadic spirit. Besides, I am only too willing to forgive you, who on earth used to be such a good worker for my kingdom. So, no harm meant, my dear Martin. This answer has infuriated Martin. Such contempt of his person is un almost unbearable. He takes a deep breath and says, Martin. Oh, you wretched scoundrel, how dare you degrade me, a citizen of heaven, in the presence of God? Don't you know what is written? Woe betide him who will lay hands on one of my anointed. I, a citizen of heaven, would be one of the anointed. And do you believe, you wretch, that the Lord will let you go unpunished for such wickedness? Says the dragon. Listen, Martin, I whom on earth, while in my pay, you used to call the prince of falsehood, have calmly told you the plain truth in reply to your infamous abuse of me in my wretchedness. And you, one of God's anointed, a citizen of heaven, blow up like a powder magazine on earth, threatening me with God's revenge if I impugn your anointed person. But tell me, who gave you the right to abuse me in such a way in the presence of God. Am not I too from God 
only with the difference that I am an infinite part of God, while you are just a particle dust out of me, recovered by the Lord from the chaff of nothingness and formed into the tiniest human spirit. If you have any respect for God, you have to respect everything that is from Him, and not only your own anointed head, which seems to be much more important to you than the Lord. Or have you measured those primordial depths of the deity in all detail to enable you to face me with the infinite fundamental wisdom and say, why are you as you should not be? Can you prove to me that I am not what I must be for creational reasons, forever unfathomable to you, to enable you to be the little bit that you are? Or do you know of a potter who makes pots without a will? What the will is to the potter, the whole world is to God. I am the matter of all the world, that's also its foundation. Therefore, I am the consolidated antithesis, the basis without which no being and evolution could ever manifest itself. From all this, you may gather with your anointed head that no doubt I too am necessary in the great order of God, and that God, by originally creating me, has surely not placed an absurdity at the root of all being and evolution. Admit that this is so, if you understand this and are willing to fully respect God. How it is that you, with your anointed head, do not understand that by abusing God's works, you are abusing God himself, calling him, in your great stupidity, of course, a bungler. Therefore, my dear Martin, calm down. For many eternities will pass before you will comprehend only a fraction of an atom of that unfathomably deep relationship between me and God. By the way, doesn't it strike you, an anointed citizen of God's heaven, as most peculiar that you have to learn meekness from me, Satan? If you still have to tell me something, Martin, speak up, but speak like a wise man and not like a silly street urchin in the world. Bear in mind that you are standing here before God and his greatest primordial spirit, whose shape and whose to you forever inconceivable defiance are annoying you because of your ignorance. Martin is considerably startled and quite at a loss what to say. He looks in turn at me and at the dragon and asks me secretly, Lord, what does it mean? How can I answer the dragon? Although inconceivable, deep down, he seems to be right. The devil and to be right. How absurd that is. But what can I say if he is right after all? No, that beats me. The devil being right. Say I, you were so keen on a dispute with him. So carry on. You must on no account allow the devil to defeat you. So endeavor to fight him to your heart's content. Go on with your dispute and refute his contention. Says Martin, Oh, what a refutation that will be. Oh dear, oh dear. I am that one. Chapter 117 Martin's temptation through Satan in the seductive shape of Satan. After a while, Martin once more turns to the dragon and says, Listen, you incorrigible depraver of all life, you mischief maker, you ancient hero of, of spiritual darkness and merciless bringer of death to all poor souls, even if you speak like a great philosopher, it is not your will that bids you speak like that, but your helplessness, since you are seized by the boundless might of the Lord. I could bet a thousand lives to one that your language would be quite different if you were free. I am fully aware that you came forth from, out of God, as a first and greatest spirit of light and purity. Your power pervaded the expanses of space, and your light shone like an eye of God. And I also know that God created you out of himself for the supreme resurrection of the freest and most blissful life, but not for the fall in which you have remained unchanged for eternities, in your stubbornness. Tell me, why aren't you on the spiritual level intended for you by the will of God? Why do you keep opposing God's will? Why do you prefer to remain forever in a state of horrible torment, 
instead of turning to the Lord, your God and Father, and enjoying a boundless measure of infinite fatherly love in freedom and supreme power. Speak, if you possess sufficient wisdom to answer my questions, says the dragon. Well, Martin, this way of asking questions is much more sensible than your previous way, and it is a credit to your spirit. You really have touched on matters that deserve a good answer. But prior to answering questions on such profound subjects, I make it a rule to test the interrogator to make sure he is capable of comprehending what I shall tell him. Therefore, I ask of the Lord, if he wishes me to answer you, to grant me full freedom for a short while, in which case I guarantee that neither you nor anyone else will be harmed in any way. If you pass my test, I will answer all your questions. If not, it will mean that you are not read yet by far for profound wisdom. I may also add that I will test you only if you insist on having your questions answered. Now decide what you want to do. Martin again turns to me and asks me what he should do. Say I, if somebody starts a job, he must also complete it. This is a foremost rule of all true life. Therefore, you will have to submit to the condition of your opponent. But I tell you, be firm, for this is an extremely cunning spirit, and his tests are clever traps. Then, turning to the dragon, I speak. You are free for a short while. Do not misuse this favor. The same moment, the dragon's horrible body dissolves, and from its dust arises a female being of such supreme beauty that the most beautiful maidens of the sun would be left far behind. A softness beyond comparison, a nobility of limbs and joints, a tenderness and whiteness of skin, there would be nothing to match this in all infinity. And the indescribably beautiful body is crowned by a head of such majestic beauty that it beats all the power of imagination. This being of inconceivable beauty looks at Martin in the most friendly manner and says in a very sweet and melodious voice, Satana, well, dear Martin, if you wish it, I shall answer your questions. But first, tell me whether you could love me if I loved you more than my life. Could you love me and through your love save me from my great torment of which you are fully aware. Speak, oh, speak, Martin. Martin is overwhelmed and scarcely able to breathe from astonishment. The extreme attraction of this being has made him violently excited. He cannot speak coherently, just stammer and stare. His whole being in every fiber is pervaded by glowing love for this to him unbearable feminine beauty. After a long while, during which he has become more and more glowing, Martin cries with all his might, Oh, heaven, 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 who could see and not love you? I love you, love you boundlessly. You most beautiful of all beings, who could be happy having seen you and knowing that you are unhappy and suffer? If I cannot save you, I would rather suffer together with you than be the most blessed spirit in heaven without you. I would give away a thousand lives for just an atom of your being. O oh, you most glorious being, speak, oh speak, what can I do to save you, to win you for myself forever? Says the changed dragon, O oh, glorious Martin, if you love me as you say, give me a passionate kiss. The kiss will save me forever, and I shall become the sweetest companion for your everlasting life, says Martin delightedly. Oh, heaven of heavens, not only one kiss, but you shall have a trillion kisses. He rushes forward to perform his task, but is stunned when this being pushes him back and cries full of contempt. Satana, stand back, lascivious rake. You did not pass your test, and therefore are not worthy of any answers from me in the future, you wretch. How could you forget God and throw yourself into my arms, mine, who am the enemy of all life, not in accordance with my own? 
Oh, you weak creature, you scum of all loathsomeness. Martin collapses in a swoon, and the dragon reverts to his previous shape. Chapter 118 Borem raises the fallen Martin and gives him advice. The Lord admonishes Martin. Possession and possessor are inseparable in heaven. Borem goes to Martin, raises him up and says, Dear brother, you are overzealous. In future, leave the action to the Lord alone. If we only take action where the Lord commands us, we shall never go wrong. To be a match for beings like this one, much more is needed than we are able to comprehend at this stage. Even an angel would not be a match for this being, except with the help of the Lord. For this primordial dragon has a thousand of the most artful means of deceit at his disposal, by which he could invingle all the heavens if only the Lord would allow it. Considering that none of the citizens of heaven would be at all safe from him without the Lord's intervention, what chance would we have as newcomers to his kingdom? When Michael, the mightiest of all angels of heaven, fought with this dragon for the body of Moses, he was conquered, and all he could do was to call the Lord's judgment upon this most wicked of beings to take its spoil away from him. And if even a Michael had to get the worst of it, what could the two of us achieve? Therefore, do be careful in future whenever it pleases the Lord for good reasons to allow an encounter with such beings whose essence is wickedness and falsehood. Now rise again and thank the Lord who alone saved you from a great evil. For as far as Satan is concerned, he would have certainly accepted your kiss. Through this, all your heavenly love would have been changed into his hellish kind of love, and with the help of his female shape, which he would not have shed so soon, he would have chained you to himself with more than iron feathers. But at that moment when you wanted to kiss him, the Lord's judgment took hold of him and threw him back into his evil nature. His boundless arrogance rose to the surface, and he knocked you back, following which he had to assume his dragon shape once more. So it was the Lord who saved you, and you had better thank him for the deliverance of your whole weak being. Now Martin quickly rises to his feet and comes rushing to me, asking my forgiveness for his great folly and thanking me from the depth of his heart for his deliverance and the admonitions through Borem. But I say to him, Martin, how much longer will I have to suffer your so often recurring folly? When will you at last start to act in accordance with your repeated good resolutions? How many more times will I have to make you realize your folly before you have become wise once and for all? Oh, you absurd kind, how much patience is needed to guide you onto the right path? Rise now and make sure you become wiser at long last. It is bad enough if some reality makes you stumble, but to allow yourselves to be conquered to the last fiber of life by a mere phantom, what an extreme weakness that requires. Martin is sobbing from remorse and keeps asking my forgiveness. Then I bend down to him, raise him and say, Behold, now that I have raised you, you can once more stand before me as a free being. But how long? will you keep yourself erect. Every true citizen of heaven must eventually achieve complete inner freedom and must not fall if for a while he has to walk an extremely slippery path. But what would happen with you if I left you completely to yourself? Would you keep your equilibrium and be sure not to fall if you had to walk a slippery path on your own? Says Martin contritely. O oh Lord, do not ever let me be complete me on my own, or I shall be lost. I shall not ever wish for absolute freedom. If I could only be the least one close to you, I would be everlasting happy. Better give also this house to my dear brother Borel, as I am quite unsuited for such a magnificent property. Say I, the Lord, calm yourself and hold fast to me in your heart and everything will be all right. However, 
I cannot take this property away from you and give it to Borem. So this is the sphere of life of Bishop Martin in the spiritual world. This is what is called his property, his house. For that would mean, says the Lord, I would be taking your life and giving it away. Here no one can possess anything which is not forthcoming out of himself. For such a living possession must stay with the possessor, as possessor and possession are inseparable in this world. Only you must never consider yourself lord of your property, and then it will keep growing in magnificence. Although every citizen of heaven is a completely free owner, of the works of his spirit, the fruits of his love for me, I alone am the Lord over every possession, as I am over every spirit. Now you know what things are like here. If you will stand firmly in my love alone in the future, your celestial property will not worry you. Chapter 119 The Lord's Dialogue with Satan Satan's Malicious Defiance the Lord's parable of the founder, Satan's adherents are saved. So remember this happens in the spiritual world in the 19th century. Now I, the Lord, turn to the dragon with the following words. Satan, how much longer will you keep tempting God, your Lord? How much longer will you abide by your boundless arrogance? What do you hope to achieve against my infinite might, which could destroy you at any time. And if it does not wish to do that, it can punish you severely, everlasting. You are aware that this is the final time allowed to you. During this time, you can still raise yourself or fall forever. What do you intend to do? My will is only too well known to you. If it were not, you would be without sin. And since my will is known to you as well, as the reward and punishment, say, what are you going to do? Behold, everything is rising against you. All the mountains will be flattened and the valleys filled. All the crowns and thrones on earth which were erected by you shall be cast in the fiery lake. What will you do? You will not ever be able to defy my mind. You will no longer be free to do anything at all. So speak. What are you going to do? Will you raise yourself or will you fall? Below you is the eternal abyss, and here am I, a father to all who love me, and here is my table. Choose and make it quick, so be it, says Satan. Lord, I know you, and I know your might and my terrible impotence compared with your boundless, everlasting might. But being aware of this fact, and feeling my importance deep within myself, I consider it a triumph for my pride to be able to defy you, yes, defy you everlastingly. And I also realize that all your might has no means of breaking my defiance and conquering my will, except by my complete annihilation, which, however, you could never look upon as a victory over me. For a spiritual victory of life could never be gained by total annihilation of the weaker opponent, but only by a wise frustration with a fundamental condition of full freedom for both parties. The basis for such a persuasion, however, must be the unrestricted right to turn to the opposite, if so desired. I am this opposite, and I shall never agree with your will justified as it may be. Even if I understand your will, I shall never adhere to it, because I want to demonstrate to you that there is another will opposed to yours, which your omnipotence shall never ban, as long as you allow me to exist. It is easy enough to be free within your will. However, to defy in greatest torment you, the Almighty Spirit, well aware of your everlasting omnipotence, your wrath, and one's own helplessness, that is greater than anything that your all-seeing eye will ever be able to see. That is also the reason of my first disobedience to you. In it, I see the greatest strife of my impotence 
against your omnipotence, for in my impotence I remain forever a victor over your omnipotence, love and wisdom, as well as your wrath, and you are unable to bend me, notwithstanding all your might, strength, love, wisdom, judgment and wrath. It is easy enough to be a Michael, a Gabriel, an Uriel, a celestial pastime, to be a seraph or a cherub, but it is quite a different thing to be a Lucifer, the greatest primordial spirit after you, knowing what infinite bliss your boundless love offers, and at the same time knowing what growing torment your judgment and wrath offer, and still scorning all beatitude and eternal torment to offer unwavering defiance forever, well aware of one's impotence, without the least hope of ever gaining anything, and knowing that one can only eternally lose such helpless greatness of a creature's will is endlessly greater than the greatness of your deity. And this knowledge brings me greater bliss in all my torment than you and all your spirits and angels could ever experience. Therefore, do not ever ask me how much longer I shall defy you. My answer shall always be the same, forever, forever, God will never bend me, say I, the Lord. Oh, you blind, ignorant spirit, how profound your death is, that you could imagine to be able to defy me. You have a pleasure in your folly, and do not realize that every true or illusory freedom, like the one you imagine to be your own, in the end, must be subject to my will. Who has ever counseled with me or grasped my ways? Are you so sure that it could not be my hidden will that you must be as you are? Do you know whether I did not perhaps destine you to fall from the very beginning? Can the work ever direct its creator how and what for he should create it? A founder makes his big crucibles out of fireproof material. They are placed in a furnace and the metal melts in them until it is quite liquid, whereupon it, it is poured into various molds. When the molds are filled, they are cooled down and not submitted to any more heat. The crucible, however, remains in the fire so that more metal may be melted in it. It is not allowed to cool down until it has become useless, in which case it is discarded forever as useless, burned out matter. Am not I a master founder of all works? If so, and if I procure for myself the tools I want, say, can you defy me at all? Or can you call it defiance if you are the way you are and cannot be any different from what I want you to be? However, I am not a hard master, but a loving one, even prepared to remove my crucibles from their permanent heat if they so desire and are willing to adapt themselves to the order of my free work. If they are not willing and prefer to remain forever my crucibles, it suits me all right, for it saves me getting new ones. But if they remain crucibles, they are what they have to be and never what they want to be, for a tool cannot be any different from the way I want it and shape it. Thus, your would-be defiance, which gives you pleasure, is nothing more than an illusion originating in your great blindness. For just as a pot cannot say to the potter, I am as I want to be, considering that the potter turns and shapes it as he wants it, you cannot tell me that you are the way you want since you have to be as I want it. But I, as eternal love itself, allow you in your judgment sufficient freedom to enable you to feel and understand your state of torment so that you can change it, if you so desire. If not, you must remain how and what you are, not because you want it this way, but because it is my will. If, however, you wish to improve your lot, I shall put another tool in your place to serve me as you have done, 
Say now whatever you like. It does not make any difference to me whether you remain what you are or whether I replace you by another two. At this, Satan is quite startled and at a loss what to say. His numerous adherents, however, cry, O oh Lord, if this is the position, deliver us from our long endured torment and replace us by new useful tools. We have had enough suffering and have become quite brittle in the fire. Therefore, have mercy upon us and reform us, O oh Lord, according to your kindness and love. Hearing this from his adherents, Satan roars and howls in a rage. Don't you want to participate in my greatness? Well, then I shall not remain what God wants, but what I myself shall wish to be. Agree with me, cry his adherents. Fool, could you ever will anything that is not God's will? Is not your would-be free will God's will? Whatever you will, you cannot do it out of yourself, but it will at all times be God's will within you, your forever unconquerable judge. You may remain under compulsion of the Lord's judgment, but we have been seized by his mercy, which is holding us, and we shall follow the better path. Say I, the Lord, then arise, you wretched beings, and be released. But you, the one, please yourself and stay what you are. Whatever you will now want to do will not be your will, but my divine will. And your will within you shall be forever my judgment within you. However, in addition to this thorough enlightenment, I allow you a short respite to enable you to ponder on the position and state in which you find yourself. If you do want to improve your lot, it will be done. If not, you will stay what you are until the last prisoner in the present period of creation has arisen from the path of the flesh. What will happen to you after that, I alone know in all infinity. At these words, Satan utters a loud cry and rushes out the door whilst his adherents throw away their dragon armor and stand there as a thousand completely naked souls of very wretched appearance asking to be healed and relieved of their considerable pains. I once more summon Martin, Borel, and also Coral and tell them to lead these wretched beings to the refreshing bath. The three immediately do as told and the thousand wretches find relief in their path. Right, this, of course, this is another very important spiritual transformation and you'll find a lot about this in uh, this work uh, from sunsets to sunrises. And finally, we have uh, chapter 201, in which the Lord says, So far, practically all messengers could only achieve something with Satan through a most severe and temporary judgment, since they were unable to hold their own against the shrewdness of his word. However, with your words, and that's the Lord addressing to Martin, you got him into such a state that in his dispute with John, he had to surrender voluntarily, which has never happened before. He is free now, and although he could move away, he is still resting in the designated place, which is good. He has, of course, still many legions doing evil in his name, which will be felt on earth, but only for a short time. Then the spring will begin to dry up, and consequently, the evil will weaken, although it will not cease altogether. But then the end of all evil will not be far away. The judgment of all evil will come through our love, which will captivate everything, and nothing will be able to resist it. Love's judgment, however, will be a constant one, forever unchangeable. It will not oppress like a heavy burden, but will simply hold captive all that does not want to be liberated. Before this judgment commences, however, we shall once more dispatch messengers to all stellar worlds with invitations to the great feast. Everyone they come across will be invited, and happy will be those who don't decline it, for their joys will be without end. So this is the conclusion of this 
most wonderful disclosures about the plan of creation and salvation, including the salvation of this first created and fallen spirit that we do our existence to also, and to his redemption we also contribute. And of course, in matters of uh, the Lord's will, one has to understand that only in love, only in the order of love, there is freedom. There is this perfect freedom of life, while in sin is only addiction and dependency and self-deceit. Therefore, there is no freedom, no freedom of creation, of action, of development in any way. This is our God, this is our creation, and fortunately, is all about love and wisdom and goodness. So, this was the brochure. You can find it in this place where I'm going to put it with the other one. And hope you may take some time, maybe, God willing, to research this. Of course, you can study the books. This is the most uh, important thing. You can, you can also find a lot of other uh, excerpts from the New Revelation that I have put on this website here on the page called Fundamental Teachings and Greatest uh, Mysteries Revealed. You can find the thematic categories and look for all the things that are important for you to discover. So again, thank you very much for watching this. God bless you with his infinite love, grace, and mercy. And hopefully we will continue with these teachings. Blessings in the Lord's name for you, for all your dear ones, for all the people of goodwill, and even for our enemies in this end time. For we know we all belong to God, and sooner or later we all come back to him in love.